Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. And the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Well, this is the word of the Lord. Amen. Well, let's pray together and ask the same Lord that delivered them from the burning fiery furnace, the one who hears our prayers, let, him ask, let us ask him to lead us today. Let's pray together. Hmm. Lord Jesus, you are the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. You uphold the universe by the word of your power. And you, Jesus, have come to earth to make purification for our sins and now are seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. You, Jesus, are the ruling and reigning king. And so we come to you, Lord, asking you today to lift up our eyes that we might see you. Lord, would you show us with as much assurance, if not more, that you are physically present with us, just as you were with these three friends in the fire. We need you today. We give you this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there are few things as terrifying as a blazing fire, particularly one that is untamed and just running rampant. I know that many of us living in Southern California, I have grown up in Southern California, have had far too many moments of turning on the news or opening up our phones or getting a text message from a friend to find out that there is a burning, raging wildfire somewhere near us. Or just that experience of all of a sudden walking outside one day and smelling fire in the air and realizing, oh no, not again. Right? There is something absolutely terrifying about a hillside being caught ablaze. The heat of a wildfire, the speed of a wildfire. I've heard it described that these wildfires oftentimes seem like they're alive, seem as though they have a mind of their own to where they're almost cruel and vicious. 
I remember one time driving to school on the 118 freeway up in Ventura County in the midst of a fire, and there was a blazing fire on both sides of the freeway. It was a terrifying experience. I suddenly realized, why am I going to school? This is not worth the risk. But when we're at a distance from a wildfire, we sometimes think, oh, it's probably not a big deal until you get face to face with it and you realize it's unpredictable. It's wild. It's dangerous. It's horrific. It can cause utter devastation. Some of us have maybe even known that on a more personal level. But very simply, we know this, that fire is hot. Fire is dangerous. And if we can avoid it, we would prefer to do so. There's been many cultures throughout the world that have used fire as a way to control people, as a way to punish people, as a way to threaten people. In fact, we see it here in the province of Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon. In fact, the ancient kingdom of Babylon, which dates back many, many hundreds of years before this present kingdom here in the book of Daniel, may have been actually the first empire to use fire as a punishment to criminals. So they're very used to using fire as a way of threatening people and controlling people. And particularly in this passage this morning, we see that King Nebuchadnezzar is using the threat of fire to get everyone to worship him and his gods. And these three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, have all decided, we will not bow down to your statue, Nebuchadnezzar. We will not worship your gods because we follow the one true God and we will only worship him. And the threat has been, if you don't bow down, you will burn in the fire. And that is the very threat. Now, if all of us this morning were threatened with either worshiping an idol or being thrown into the fire, if you choose to worship Jesus, you'll be thrown into the fire. I wonder how many of us would have a very strong internal struggle. I think if we're honest, all of us would have it for at least a few moments because we'd rather not face fire for following Jesus. We'd prefer to avoid that. Okay, I'll take obvious statements for 400, please, right? (laughs) We would rather avoid burning alive for following Jesus, okay? And because that's true, we often avoid standing for Jesus if it means facing fire. Now, we may not face literal fire today in our part of the world, But we all face some kind of suffering, some kind of pushback if you're going to truly associate and stand with Jesus in a context where no one else is. And the truth is we often avoid standing for Jesus if it means fire. But what we see so beautifully in Daniel chapter 3 is that no one delivers like Jesus. No one delivers like Jesus. Even the pagan king would come to realize that. You need deliverance? This is the God you go to. Yes and amen. No one delivers like Jesus. And if you are in Christ, you follow him, Jesus is your deliverer. And because he's your deliverer, you can walk through the fire. You can walk through the fire. Let's look at this passage together where first and foremost we see And because Jesus is our deliverer, we can face the fire. We can face the fire. That's exactly what's happening here in this story. As they choose not to worship Nebuchadnezzar's golden image that he set up amongst many, many, many people, probably thousands upon thousands that are bowing down to him, they've been told beforehand, if you don't bow, you'll be thrown into this furnace. This big heaping pile of fire, you'll go in there if you don't worship Jesus. Or I'm sorry, if you don't worship the statue. If you choose to worship your God, you'll be thrown in there. And this story in Daniel chapter 3 is a story that is on constant loop and repeat. You remember when you were younger and you had the CD player and you just kept hitting repeat on the song over and over? You just wanted to listen to that one song again and again and again because you just liked it so much? Well, this is a story, whether you like it or not, it's just on repeat constantly. It just happens again and again and again, every single day, all around the world, all of the time until Jesus returns. This is a story that is just copy paste again and again. It looks a little different in different contexts, but if you stand with Jesus, you'll face the fire. That's the story that's on repeat. Choose to stand with Jesus and you'll face the fire. 
So the question is, well, what is the fire? What is the fire for us today in our context where we live? Well, it's, it's many things. Any kind of suffering that comes from your union with Christ is some kind of fire. That may be persecution. That may be the cost you have to pay to walk in obedience to Jesus in the midst of a world that refuses to do so. That will bring suffering. So it may be ridicule from those that you know and love. It may be the loss of friends and family who want nothing to do with you because you associate with Jesus. It may be shame. It may be literally just feeling really uncomfortable all the time. It may be increased hostility from not just people, but maybe organizations or movements. It may be missing out on things that everyone else gets to experience. It may be the pain of choosing to forgive someone because Christ has forgiven you. It may be the suffering that comes from living with humility like Christ does and laying down our lives for others. It may be the pain or the fire that comes from denying yourself and denying your flesh and serving others. You see, there's all kinds of opposition, pushback, pain and suffering that comes from following Jesus. Some of it is very minor. Some of it is extremely heavy and painful. Some of it is horrific. But Jesus promised us, in this world, you will have trouble. They persecuted me, they'll persecute you. That was from Jesus. He told us what to expect. He said, count the cost of following me. A king does not go to war without first counting the cost of whether or not he can pay the price to see the war through. Don't come and follow me unless you count the cost of following me because in this world, you will have trouble. But then he says, take heart because I have overcome the world. I am your deliverer, but count the cost. Because if you're going to follow Jesus, you engage in a life of willingly walking towards fire. If you think following Jesus means walking the easy road, it might not be Jesus you're following. Jesus said, they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. Some of you have had this trouble. Some of you have experienced this kind of fire in your life. Some of you haven't, but you will. In fact, we know that all around the world, our brothers and sisters in Christ are facing the fire all the time. It's easy for us to forget these things. It's easy for us to distance ourselves from these stories, from these people. But we need to be reminded, these are our brothers and sisters all around the world who are literally faced with, if you follow Jesus, you'll you'll get the fire. There's one woman in the middle of Colombia who has experienced this before. It's a story from um, a book about Christian martyrs. It says, here's how the story goes. A small number of children in the village of Santana Ramos in Colombia enjoyed coming to school and learning from their teacher, Dora Lilia Saavedra. She prayed with them every day and told them about Jesus while they learned. She also sometimes traveled for hours to more distant villages where there were no teachers to help the children there. She was a good, loving teacher who told them about Jesus. But one day, the children's ordinary school day was interrupted when two men with guns walked into the school and interrupted, told the children to leave and said, there won't be any more school today. The children quickly gathered their belongings and slipped out of the schoolhouse, wondering what was going to happen. But Dora Lilia and her husband knew what was going to happen. They were prepared for this moment. The men who had come for them were guerrilla soldiers with the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, who had for decades terrorized and targeted Christians. But the night before this day... Dora Lilia was warned by a neighbor of hers that she and her husband would be killed the following day. And the furthest thing from her mind was to take her family and flee the village, though she was advised to do so. Instead, that evening, her and her husband led their children in family devotions. They prayed and read the Bible together. 
She said to her daughter, Mommy may be going to sleep tomorrow for a long time. And after the kids were in bed, the couple spent much of the night praying and fasting, reminiscent of Jesus' time with his father in prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed, Not my will be done, but yours. When morning came, they went to the school as usual, knowing that their lives and those of their children were in the Lord's hands. So after the soldiers marched in that day, the children were left behind as Dora Lilia and her husband were taken out of the schoolhouse, led across a field about 300 yards away, and they were put to death. But so influential was her faith in Jesus that just a few months afterwards, their oldest daughter... Their 12-year-old daughter was able to say, if I met the men who did this, I would forgive them. Her parents had taught her the love and forgiveness of Christ in place of hatred and bitterness. There's a story of two people who knew that to follow Jesus meant to willingly walk towards the fire. How in the world... Do you willingly face fire like that? The only way that you do that, the only way, is if you have a compelling reason to do so. No one wants to do that of their own. The only way you do that is if you have a compelling reason to do so. So what is the compelling reason? The compelling reason is that Jesus is our deliverer. It is who he is. We are called to follow him and to obey him as our deliverer. No one else. He is the one who promises to take care of us and to deliver us no matter what we face. Maybe some of you have heard before, um, kind of that little game where it, it goes like this. You've been captured and the main character from the last TV show you watched is in charge of your rescue. Have you ever heard this before? No, I'm the only one. Okay. Right? For some of you, that would be great if that person was your deliverer and rescuer. Maybe it was like Jack Bauer from 24 or something like that. That's an old show. I just dated myself. Um, or, you know, maybe you're, you're really doomed because it's like Mickey Mouse or something like that. You watch a children's show, right? But the truth is, is we look to a thousand things and a thousand people to deliver us from whatever trouble that we're in all the time. But as followers of Jesus, we have been called to look to Christ and Christ alone at all times, no matter what fire, no matter what trouble we're in, he and he alone is our deliverer. Those that have walked through the fire and been delivered by Jesus know this. And we're encouraged by their words like the words of David in 2 Samuel. I have the verse up here on the screen, 2 Samuel chapter 22. Here's what David says after experiencing deliverance. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. He's my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Those of you that follow Jesus know that he's your deliverer. He has first and foremost, saved you from your sins. Your greatest enemy, your greatest trouble, the greatest fire that could ever come for you is the wrath of God for your sins and you've been delivered and saved by that through trusting in Jesus if you've turned to him. So we know he's our deliverer. We also know that he's worthy of laying down our lives. I love what it says in this passage. It comes from the mouth of Nebuchadnezzar about these folks He says about them, they refused to serve and worship any God except their own God. They refused to serve and worship any other God except their own God. May that be true of us. We refuse to worship anyone or anything other than Christ. Why? Because he's worthy of worship. There's nobody like him. To these three friends, worship mattered more than anything. Does it to you? Does it to me? So why face this fire willingly? Well, because Jesus is our deliverer, because he's worthy of our worship, but also because 
when we do, we show off His glory. You realize we wouldn't have the story if the three friends didn't decide to face the fire. There would be no story. There would be no deliverance. You remember what Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 15? Who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Well, let us show you by facing the fire in his name. You see, when we do this, we show off the glory of God. We show to the Nebuchadnezzars there's something different about this Jesus. What in the world is it that you would be willing to walk through that kind of fire for him? It shows the glory of God. And so we're regularly faced with this decision to either run from the fire or face it. You know, it's interesting how firefighters are pretty much universally loved. I don't know that I've met someone that doesn't like firefighters, right? They're like just the heroes, right? Everybody sees a firefighter and cheers and wants a picture with them. They're generally very handsome, strong, like people just like firefighters. But what is it about firefighters that we like? They run into what everyone else runs away from. That's what they do. It's amazing. It's such a grace of God that right now at this moment, we have people in our city who are ready to lay down their lives and run into a burning building to rescue you. And they've never met you. They don't know you. Isn't that crazy? I think that's amazing that there's just people literally sitting in a house at the ready for a call to save you. They're ready to run into the fire when everyone else will run away. That's what firefighters do. It's first and foremost for us a wonderful picture of Christ. The only one who willingly runs into the fire to rescue us from our sins. No one else will do that for you, but Christ will and He has. But it's also a picture of who we are to be as Christ's representatives. Those who are willing to run into the fire if it means showing the world the glory of God. It's a picture of us living our lives, like Romans 12 would say, a living sacrifice. Or as Romans 6 would say, presenting our members to God as instruments of righteousness. To say, God, everything I am, everything I have is yours. My very body is yours. Because look at what it would say in verse 28, that these, these three friends yielded up their bodies. It wasn't just their hearts and their minds that liked to worship God. They were willing to yield up their very bodies to the fire. They did not claim their bodies as their own, that they had authority over, that they could make their own decisions and use however they please. They said, God, my body belongs to you. I yield it up for your glory. Do we? Do we offer God our very bodies? Do we offer Him our jobs, our homes, our wallets, our time? our mornings, our influence to Him. So these three friends, they believe that God is their deliverer. We saw that last week. So clearly they believe this. So they willingly face the fire, trusting that God would deliver them. And guess what it got them? Thrown into the fire. That's their reward. They're standing for the Lord, believing He's going to deliver, and the next thing they know, they are in the fire. We talked about this last week. I don't think this is how they imagined this going. Right? Picture the scene. They're standing for God. They're strong. They're willing to be, to look foolish, to worship their God. They stand before the king and they say, Oh, king, let me tell you about our God. He will deliver us. He's going to deliver us. In fact, even if he doesn't deliver us, even if he didn't, even if he couldn't, we still wouldn't worship your statue. They are confident this God's going to deliver them. And now they're standing bound. 
on the precipice of the furnace. And I have to imagine wondering, God, when? Listen, it is close here. Like, it, you could have done this at least within the last 30 minutes. You still haven't done it. You're running out of time, God. Are you going to deliver us? We're facing the fire. We're here. We did this for you. Where are you? Did we do something wrong? And there they are. And the next thing that they know, they're in the fire. God did not save them from being thrown into the fire. Oh, we wish that he did in our lives. We wish he would save us before the fire. But the power of Jesus is that because he's deliverer, not only can we face the fire, but he's with you in the fire. Because the moment that they're in, Nebuchadnezzar throws his chair backwards and stands up astonished. Because there's more than three people in the fire and it's not one of the guards who haphazardly fell in. There's a fourth person in the fire. Look at what Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 25. I see four men. So he has to check the math really quick. We threw three in, right? (laughs) Just three. Okay. Because I see four, and it's making me nervous. I see four in the fire. Unbound. Walking in the midst of the fire. And they're not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Now listen, this is Nebuchadnezzar's pagan way of saying, the fourth one in there looks like someone that belongs to the pantheon of gods that I worship. That fourth one in there looks divine in some way. There's something about the fourth one that's different than just the three others. There's something radiant. There's something powerful. There's something majestic. There's something godlike about the fourth person. Nebuchadnezzar believes he's seeing nothing less than a god. The question is, who is it? Who's in the fire with them? Well, if you know your scriptures, you know many times throughout the Old Testament, God shows up. God appears. Sometimes it just says that God appeared in the smoke. Or sometimes it says that God just appeared in the fire. Or sometimes it will just say things like, and God spoke to Moses face to face. In some way, God is showing up. In some way, he's even physically present in some of those ways. There's also moments throughout the Old Testament where it will say, the angel of the Lord appeared to them. Now, sometimes an actual, just simple, plain old, ordinary, everyday angel shows up, but sometimes it says, the angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the people's response to the angel of the Lord is to ascribe worship to him, to often bow down to him. And in fact, the angel of the Lord is often identified with God himself. Leading most scholars, and I think rightly so, to believe this is probably Jesus Christ himself showing up in his pre-incarnate state. Incarnation being taking on human flesh. Okay? Jesus has always existed, but when he came to earth, he took on human flesh. So his pre-incarnate state, Jesus showing up as the angel of the Lord. He's worshipped, he's considered God himself, and he doesn't rebuke the people for worshipping him. Why? Because he's God. It's Jesus. It's him showing up. Joshua chapter 5 is a wonderful example of this. Look with me at Joshua chapter 5. This is uh, Joshua who's leading the people of Israel at this point, right before the famous story of um, when they walk around Jericho and the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. They're coming up to Jericho. They're very nervous. They're very afraid. Here's what happens. Joshua lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him, went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Great question when you see somebody that powerful. 
And he said, no. (laughs) But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Drawn sword, sword in hand. Now I have come. The question isn't if I'm with you or I'm with them. The question is, are you with me? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped because this is our deliverer. Jesus showing up to Joshua and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet. For the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. If you remember the story of the burning bush, when God appears to Moses in the burning bush, he says the same thing. Take your sandals off because the ground you're standing on is holy ground. This is no ordinary angel. This is Christ. Showing up to meet with his people and to walk with them and to deliver them. Now, regardless of whether the one here is Jesus, I think it is. Or it's just an angel. At minimum, here's what it communicates. It is a clear, physical demonstration of God's presence with His people. A clear, physical demonstration of God's presence with His people. And a reminder to us that deliverance is found in a person and not in a formula. Jesus shows up to save them. That's how important they were to him. Jesus came physically to save them. But they didn't do it, he didn't do it how they thought. Jesus didn't fit into probably the formula that they had concocted in their brain. He did it in his way, in his timing, with his power for his glory. No one is saved from their sins because they discovered the correct prayer to pray. No one. No one is saved from their sins because they found the correct book to read. No one is saved from their sins because they found the correct way to live. Salvation is found in coming to a person, Jesus. It is found in coming to him with your life to say, Jesus, I need nothing and no one but you. I am not saved by my goodness, by my effort, by my morality, by my commitment. I am saved only by surrendering everything to you. And you bring deliverance in your way. And what was his way? To physically come to earth to deliver us. It was that important to him. To come to earth, to live the perfect life that we should have lived in obedience to God. To face the fire of persecution for following God perfectly and to ultimately go to the cross to receive the wrath of God for your sins and my sins. And if we will simply turn from our sins and trust in Him, we'll be saved. I guarantee you, if God gave humanity all of eternity to come up with deliverance plans for how we would be rescued and saved for our sins, not one of us would have written this plan. It was deliverance God's way, God's timing, God's glory. So deliverance is found in a person, not a formula. And so these three friends find themselves in the fire with Jesus. We read this last week, but Isaiah chapter 43, the prophet Isaiah gave God's people a promise before Babylon came. This whole chapter actually is about them being in Babylon and the rescue God will bring for them. You got to believe these three friends are remembering this part of the scriptures because it's pertinent to what they're doing right now. Isaiah 43 gives them this promise. Thus says the Lord, 
who created you and who formed you. Fear not. I have redeemed you. I've already done it. It's as good as done. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, what's the promise? I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, notice, not when you go around the fire, when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. The promise is not, I will take you around the water, I will take you around the flames. What is the promise? The promise is, I will take you through them. Why? Well, maybe, maybe because the worship, the experience, the joy of God being with us comes only in the furnace. Only in the furnace. Not in the detour around it. The true delight of God's presence with us is most experienced in the fire. It's not the way we want it, but it's the way it is. Listen, I know that many of you in this room have walked through your own kinds of fire with Jesus. Ask a follower of Jesus who has walked the road of deep suffering, and they'll tell you they won't trade it in. If they could, they wouldn't go back and trade it. Why? Because of the nearness of Christ they now know through the furnace. There is something that those know that have walked through deep suffering with Jesus by their side. They know that it's better to walk through the fire with Jesus than to avoid the fire without him. There is a treasure and a pleasure of knowing Christ in the suffering. There's something far sweeter than going around trials. It's going through them with Jesus. And it's happening in this moment. And we read this story as if everything happens in about 15 seconds. But look at what it says. It says that Nebuchadnezzar looks in and they are unbound, walking in the midst of the fire. Walking in the midst of the fire. And they are not hurt. I don't think this is just five seconds in the fire with Jesus and then they're out. They're in there long enough that Nebuchadnezzar realizes there's more than three, stands up, consults with his officers that there's, well, they only threw three in, sees four, notices the appearance of the fourth, realizes that they are not bound, they're not hurt, they're not burning. In fact, they're even walking around. There's some time happening here. So these three friends are in the fire with Jesus and they have this prolonged fellowship in the furnace. One commentator says, almost as if they were enjoying it. Listen, this is the big threat. This is the, this is the big, scary, don't follow your God thing, or you'll get this. And now what's happening? The three friends are in it. They're experiencing it, and they're with Jesus, and they're just walking around. <laughs> they're with Jesus. They're unbound. They're not hurt. In fact, they're safe. Maybe even enjoying it. Maybe even wondering, Jesus, do we have to go back out? I want to deal with that guy again. Can we just stay in the fire with you? There's that kind of opportunity for every single one of us as we walk through the fire with Jesus to realize He's not waiting for us on the other side. He's not behind us before we got through it. He's right here with us and he walks around in it with us. There's a prolonged fellowship available to us. Because God walks with his people. That's who he is. That's what he does. It's what he's always done. 
Remember when it says in the book of Genesis that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day? Or when God would walk and talk with Abraham, who he called his friend? Or when God spoke with Moses face to face? Or when Jesus spends so many days and years walking around with his disciples? This is what God does. He walks with his friends. Not just through the luscious green hillside, but through the fire. Maybe today, some of you need an assurance of God's presence. Maybe some of you need an assurance that God is physically present with you right now in the fire. It's available to us. In fact, his word gives us the assurance crystal clear. Jesus promises, I will never leave you or forsake you. And whatever scenario you have thought up to where I will leave you or forsake you, get it out of here because nothing will separate you from my love. I will always be with you and never forsake you. That's God's promise to his people. So do you need assurance that he's with you in the fire? Look to his word and he gives it to you in a rock solid way. But you also have the freedom to ask your good and kind father, God, would you give me an assurance? Would you show me? I'm weak. I'm struggling to believe what you say. Would you show me? Would you demonstrate to me that you are physically present with me? Ask him that. You don't think God loves to hear you ask for an assurance of his presence with you? Maybe today you need that from him. But what's amazing is that Jesus doesn't just go through the fire with us. Jesus goes through the fire for us. Jesus goes through the fire alone. On our behalf. On the cross, Jesus experiences the abandonment of God. When he passed through the waters of the cross, there was no one by his side. When he felt the fire of God's wrath burn him through, there was no relief. There was no other companion with him in the fire. He went alone. No one to carry his burdens no one to encourage him, no one to strengthen him, no deliverance. So we ask, why would God be with these three friends through the fire, but then when his son goes to the cross, leave him? Why would God promise to never leave us and never forsake us, sinners who rebel against him all of the time, and yet the moment of his son's greatest need, he leaves him alone. Why? Because he loves you. Because he wanted to deliver you from your sins. Because he wanted to rescue you. And Jesus co-signed the plan. He was fully on board. It says that he did this with the joy that was set before him. It was a joy for Jesus to walk through the fire alone with no deliverance available to him to rescue you so that you never, ever, ever, ever have to face the fire of God's wrath for your sins and die. He did it instead and just says, friends, trust in me and you'll be delivered. All who trust in Jesus can have full guarantee of his presence, no matter what. No matter what you face, no matter what you suffer, no matter what you lose, you'll always have him. And the amazing result of this story, they come out of the fire. It says, everyone marveled that the fire had, had not had any power over the bodies of these men. They're the hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed and no smell of fire had come upon them. I can't cook a hot dog on my Weber grill without coming in smelling like fire for the next 12 hours. They walked through the fire and there was no trace of it on them. 
Because when Jesus is your deliverer, not only can you face the fire, not only does he walk through the fire with you, but the fire won't consume you. It won't. It can't. In fact, what it does do is refine you. It actually serves you. What? It serves you. You know, the whole reason this furnace is probably out here in the plain of Dura is to make the statue. It's probably the whole reason why it's there. Not initially to just be a threat to people. That would be way too much effort. They needed to make this giant 90 foot high golden statue. They needed to refine some gold. They needed to craft some metal. It's probably why it's out here. To craft a graven image of a foreign god. And now in this moment, that same furnace is being used to refine God's people and lead to their good and their shaping and their crafting to look more like Christ. It's what it means to be, Romans 8 would say, more than conquerors. We don't just conquer our enemies in Christ. Our enemies get up from their graves and start serving us. And benefiting us and making us look more like Christ. And the Bible is filled with this wisdom that suffering for Jesus is a refining fire. 2 Corinthians 4, we talk about how suffering produces for us an eternal weight of glory. 1 Peter 1, we talk about how trials test the genuineness of our faith and refine it. It removes the impurities James 1 would talk about how testing and trials, we should count them as joy because they produce steadfastness in us. Romans 5 would say that suffering leads to perseverance. Perseverance leads to character and character leads to hope and hope doesn't put us to shame. Malachi chapter 3, God would call himself the refiner's fire. I am the one who will draw out all of the impurities from you and it won't feel good. But on my name, by the end, it'll look good. It'll look like my son. In fact, Pastor John Piper would say it this way. He says it wonderfully. God is a refiner's fire, and that makes all the difference. Because a refiner's fire doesn't destroy like a forest fire. A refiner's fire doesn't consume completely like the fire of an incinerator. A refiner's fire refines It melts down the bar of silver or gold, separates out the impurities that ruin its value, burns them up, and leaves the silver and gold intact. He is like a refiner's fire. We are shot through with impurity of rebellion and unbelief. We fall short of God's glory again and again. If he were only a forest fire, heaven would be empty. If he were only an incinerating fire, heaven would be empty. And if he were no fire at all, heaven would be empty. We need God to refine us. And here's the truth. Even if it takes your life standing for Jesus, you'll be delivered. There is no other God who's able to rescue in this way. Jesus is your deliverer. So you can walk through the fire. Let's pray together.